Okay, so um, hi everyone. I'm Gergely from Rising Stack. Um, if you don't know Rising Stack, Rising Stack started as a Node.js development and consulting company, and um, Lately, based on the customer's feedback and the problems, challenges that we saw, we started to build Trace, which is a Node.js and microservice monitoring solution. So if you are developing services with Node.js, then check it out. Um, it's in open beta, so feel free to play uh, with it. Um, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter, and also if later on you have any questions, just drop me an email. And yeah, you can find Trace at trace.risingstat.com. So today, I'm here to talk about the road to Node.js. But before I do so, let me ask a question. Who knows uh, what's the common in these companies? Come on. OK, uh, so uh, the one at thing, at least, that they have in common is that they both pioneered uh, Node.js to a really high level. and. Uh, they are one of the flagship users of Node.js. So today, uh, my presentation will have two main um, parts. The first part will be what's Node.js and why you should start using it. Uh, why the second part will be about best practices. Uh, this will be a more of a practical thing. So uh, basically, how you should get started building Node.js based applications. So what's Node.js? Node.js is a server-side JavaScript framework to run JavaScript on the server, in very short. Uh, let's see how it's possible. Um, the first thing that you have to notice about Node.js is that it's using the same JavaScript engine that you have in Chrome. It's using the, the latest one. If you're using the latest Node.js, you are getting the latest Chrome, uh, latest V8 engine. The next thing uh, is how Node.js works in the background. So in traditional programming languages, you are used to uh, the blocking way of dealing with input-output operations. And in, the, in practice, what it means is if that if you want to read a file, for example, uh, you have to wait till that operation uh, is returned. And if you do other things like fetching HTTP uh, resources or talking with databases, you will have this same uh, blocking thing. So your application will actually halt at that point and will have to wait uh, for the return of that external service. While on the other hand, what Node.js does is completely different. What it does, it actually registers uh, things called callbacks to uh, different events. And once the, these events are done, then your application gets notified. And uh, this is how uh, Node.js can work in a way uh, which makes it really fast and scalable. So you can handle thousands of uh, threads easily. Speaking of threads, there are only a single thread from a developer's point of view. So you don't have to uh, deal with mutexics, for example. Uh, it's all hidden from you. Uh, so Node.js is single-threaded and asynchronous and event-driven. This is actually, if you remember from the, first, uh, the slide before, uh, the, those non-blocking things is implemented using events. So this is why I'm saying that Node.js is even driven. So this is the very uh, technical things from Node.js that you have to understand before diving into it. But let's see uh, what are the benefits of actually using these technologies that I just talked about. The first thing we have to point out is productivity. Uh, when PayPal started to use Node.js two or three years ago, they reported a 100% increase in productivity compared to the Java stack. So that's a really huge number. Um, the next uh, really good example of the productivity increase is what's enabled it. Uh, any NPM now has more than 250,000 packages. Uh, that's a lot more than the second one, for example, Maven has. And what it enables you is you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you like to build things. But you can actually just go on NPM, search for different modules, and you, will, you can easily use them. So most of the things are only an NPM install away. Uh, you can think of NPM like if you're using PHP Composer or if you're using uh, Java, the Maven package manager. The next thing. Uh, 
I want to mention here, which is pretty important, as, and uh, it was pointed out in the previous talk as well, is that when you are using Node.js, you are using the same language on both the front end and the back end. So if you have front end developers, it's really easy to get them started with Node.js. And also, if they have to touch some APIs, they can do it quite easily, because they only have to modify, for example, the interfaces. Uh, the next thing, which is also pretty important when talking about Node.js, is the performance aspect. Uh, one of the greatest examples here is how Walmart is using Node.js. Um, they, uh, all of their mobile uh, um, content and mobile APIs are now served by Node.js. And uh, they handle all the Black Friday loads without a glitch in the past uh, years using Node.js. It means in practice is that um, there are some graphs on Twitter you can search for that CPU load never went over one percentage during peak in Black Friday. The next really important thing to point out uh, about using Node.js is developer happiness. So as you all know, finding great talents is really hard, very challenging. Uh, and if you use cutting edge technologies like Node.js, the best talents really like to work with these technologies. So this, to start using Node.js is not just help get great talent, but also help retain them. And one other thing that uh, some enterprise users pointed out before why right, they didn't start using Node.js because it didn't have long-term support. Now that's not the case. Node.js uh, is now part of the Node.js Foundation, and uh, now they have long-term support releases. It's very similar to the one that you're used to, for example, from the Linux Foundation. So all the releases will be maintained for at least 30 months. So you don't have to worry about if a security leak is get fixed or not. So I think it's safe to say that JavaScript is eating the world. So everything that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. Um, that was the first part of the presentation about why you should use it. Uh, it's time to continue with best practices, uh, how you should um, pioneer Node.js for you and your, for your company. The very first thing is how you should start your projects. You should start your project using the npm init command. Uh, this is the command which will ask for a couple of things, like, for example, the name of the, uh, pack, uh, the module or the application that you, uh, you want to build, and it will simply give you back a package JSON file, uh, which will contain some skeletal meta, meta information for the application. Um, and uh, actually, I think maybe I will be the first one to actually open up an editor. Uh, uh, and I would like to show you uh, in a very small real life application uh, of how you should do Node.js based applications. So. OK, so this is the package JSON file that uh, npm init for will generate for you. As you can see, you only have the name here, the version, some description, which I totally forgot to fill out. And um, also, it will uh, contain license information and some links to your GitHub project. What, but what's most important here is more important here is the dependencies that your uh, modules are depending on. Uh, this example is just a, a very small REST API that uh, sends back uh, the package JSON, this file, to the client. <laughs> yeah, not very useful. So um, this is the dependency, the only dependency that it has to run in production. It's depending on Express, which is a web framework. It's pretty important to note here that Node.js has a built-in HTTP server, so you don't have to use Apache or any other uh, web servers to start developing Node.js-based applications. And also another important uh, part here is the dev dependencies section, which is just the modules that are needed to uh, run your applications in a development mode. And uh, let's see the code and what you should follow there. Uh, the very first line is the use strict statement. Uh, after the presentation, I'd like to ask you to check all your JavaScript files and see if you have them. It will uh, save you a lot of headaches, like re redefining variables, 
or redefining the same properties an object, and a lot of things. So this is the very first thing that you should check after the presentation. After that, you can see that I'm requiring some modules, the file system module, which will read the file, and the express, which will serve uh, the HTTP requests. And let's see how this event-driven asynchronous nature of JavaScript is used here. So in the 10th line, I'm creating a simple root handler, um, which gets the request and response object. And um, of course, if we want to return with the file, we have to read it first. So here you can see that I'm reading the package.json file uh, using uh, UTF-8. And this is the first concept that you have to understand here. These are called error-first callbacks uh, in JavaScript and Node.js, which means that uh, all the asynchronous operations, when you pass a callback to an asynchronous function, the first parameter has to be an error, and the second or third one can be data objects. And also, because this error will be populated, if anything goes wrong, you have to check if it's undefined or not, or null or not. So this will actually stop the execution of that given callback here, and will call another callback, which I will talk in a sec. So once we have this, what we want to do is, because it's just a string, we have to parse it to have a, a JavaScript object. And we, you can do it with json.parse. But the tricky thing here is that now we have another error handling part, because here we handled asynchronous errors, but json.parse will be synchronous. So here we can use, and we have to use, try catch. Because if the string is more formed or it has any problems, it cannot be parsed, then you have to catch the error if you don't want your application to go down. So here we are catching synchronous errors with try catch. Please note that you cannot try catch callbacks. So because callbacks don't have return values, it cannot be used for that. And also here, if there is an error in the synchronous operation, we can still call uh, the next thing, which is another callback. Actually, this next is used to uh, signal express that there was an error. And we use that here as well. But if everything goes right, then we just simply return the content of, that, uh, of the package JSON file. And let's see what, what this next will trigger. This next will trigger in Express, uh, Express Error Handler. Uh, what's unique about an Express Error Handler is that it has four parameters. So this is how Express can identify that this function should be called if there was an error. So here we have to log our error, so we can later on check what, what, what went wrong. But please note that by design, I'm not, exp uh, uh, not, I'm not sending back what the error was uh, for the user. It's not because it's ugly, but you may leak some credentials in the error message. For example, if you're using MySQL, usually MySQL error contains the uh, connection URL for that given uh, instance. So you shouldn't put uh, the error message back to the user, but you should log it. Uh, and the other thing here is, again, an asynchronous callback. The app.listen simply listens, starts a replication and binds, our app, uh, binds, binds the Express server to a given port. So that's it. Uh, let's see what it does. What's happening? OK, as you can see, our server star started. And if we do go localhost. Yeah, so that's my package JSON. So nothing fancy, just reads the file and sends it back. OK, and one thing that, yeah, I think that's it for now. And let's go back to the presentation. So uh, another thing that you should really do is you should always use the latest uh, long-term supported Node.js versions. Uh, in the past months, there was a lot of uh, security-related issues with Node.js. And they are fixed every time pretty uh, soon, so you should always uh, be on the latest uh, Node.js version. Also, another thing uh, related to versions is, uh, you don't see it, but you should make a habit to update your dependencies on a weekly basis. 
So actually what we are doing at Rising Stack is that on every Monday, we update all our, uh, pack, uh, all our packages and all our applications to use the latest modules. For that, there is a tool called, which you don't see, but it's here in the project, which you will find on GitHub. It's called uh, NCU, which stands for this module, NPM Check Updates. It will check your NPM shrink wrap or your package JSON file against uh, the NPM registry to see if you have the latest version of Node.js or not. Not Node.js, sorry, the modules that you have. Uh, so this is one thing that you should really start doing. The other thing is uh, what you should do next if you, if you want to get started with Node.js. Um, first of all, you don't see it, but there is a Node Weekly newsletter. It's on nodeweekly.com. Uh, and it serves the latest news, latest modules, whatever, on Node.js, so you should really sign up for that. Uh, the second thing is there is a website called nodeschool.io. It has workshop pairs, which you can install on your machine and start doing them on your own, or there are a lot of places where uh, you can host them, for example. Also, there is a pretty great uh, meetup group here, the Node.js Vienna meetup group, so you should go uh, to their meetups. And the next thing is you should read uh, on our blog uh, the Not Hero series. We just started it a couple of weeks ago, and they really target uh, people who just want to get started with Node.js, and they are going from the very basics till how you build complex applications with Node.js. So it's on blog.risingsdeath.com. That was it. Thank you very much. Okay, so questions. Yeah, about 100% increase of productivity at PayPal. What exactly does that mean? It means that uh, they created multiple teams of Java people and not JS people uh, um, solving the same problem. And in all of the cases, the teams with the same size solve the problems twice as fast compared to the Java team. Regarding quick prototyping, what are the best Node.js and VC frameworks to develop web stuff? Uh, here I think uh, Express and Core is a pretty good start. Also, you can go, well, they are not really MVCs. If you're looking for MVC, uh, maybe Sales uh, is the framework you should look for. Okay. Uh, how high is the risk that updating dependencies can break your app? Well, if you have unit tests and integration tests, you should be pretty okay. Uh, and of course you have them, right? So it's not a problem. How to trust NPM from production in the life of left pad? Oh, the left pad gate. Nice. Um, that's a really good one. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I have the right answer for that. Um, but NPM made a lot of uh, efforts to make sure that this won't happen again. So uh, they now have policies that once you have a module that at least some other module is depending on it, you cannot unpublish it. So uh, a thing like the left pad, left pad gate won't happen again. Thank you very much. <laughs>